Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this talk. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a new simplified architecture for the console service mesh. And if you went to the keynote yesterday, you might have heard an announcement from Armon about console data planes. And that's what this talk is going to be about. I'm going to dive a little more uh, into the details of what that architecture looks like. Um, and I'm going to go over why we did that re-architecture in the first place. So my name is Irina Shostava, uh, and I'm one of the engineers on the console team. Uh, so what I want to cover with you today is kind of three main topics. First is what is the current service mesh architecture for console? What does it look like and how did we arrive there in the first place? Then I'll cover some of the challenges with this current architecture. Um, and then lastly, I'll talk about this new redesign, what does it look like, um, and so on. Um, along the way, there will also be uh, two live demos. So hopefully the demo gods are with me and um, everything goes well. So let's start with the current service mesh architecture. Um, and before I kind of dive into what it looks like, I wanted to do a little kind of history tour. Um, and many of you probably know, but console launched in 2014. Um, and as a product, it was designed to solve the problems that people were having at the time. It was designed for environments that people were running at the time. And so what, what did those environments look like? Well, first, probably uh, most people were running on VMs or on bare metal. Uh, there was minimal orchestration, so um, if you had any orchestration, it was probably something that was homegrown. And as a result of that, we have in a, these static environments. The, your infrastructure was hard to change, and so you would end up with these more static environments as a result. In 2018, we launched Console Service Mesh, and that service mesh was launched on top of existing architecture. So uh, that original architecture we designed in 2014, we used as a foundation for the service mesh that we built on top of that. Now, I kind of mentioned the word service mesh a few times, and for those of you that are already very familiar with it, uh, just bear with me, but I do want to do like a very brief intro into what is a service mesh in the first place. And when I think about a service mesh, to me the best definition of it is that it's an abstraction layer for your networking. And having that abstraction layer gives you several benefits, uh, especially if you're running microservices. Uh, the first benefit that I think is the most important why people choose uh, service mesh in the first place, it's zero trust security. If you have your networking in a separate abstraction layer, it's very easy to add things like TLS encryption and get that for free without a single line of code change uh, to your application. Second is the service discovery. Uh, typically service meshes come with some service registry that make it very easy to discover services. And uh, third is traffic management, so that refers to things like, for example, uh, fault injection or uh, something like blue-green deployments. Lastly, there's metrics and observability, and this is because a lot of the service meshes already integrate with very popular observability tools, so again, you kind of get that for free once you add a service mesh. Now I want to look at a generalized architecture for a service mesh. There's two main components. There's control plane and there's data plane. Data plane is responsible for routing your traffic. Uh, this is typically done with some sort of a proxy that helps you route the traffic between your services. And control plane is kind of controlling how this traffic is routed. So the control plane is telling 
the, the data plane, things like the IPs of your services or any other advanced configuration you may have. Okay, so now I want to look at console service mesh. Again, I, I kind of want to start with the data plane and you may notice that the data plane for console looks very similar to generalized service mesh. You have your services and then you have your proxies running alongside them. The only specific thing here is that console is using Envoy to route that traffic. Now, console control plane consists of two components. There's console servers and then there's console clients. Console servers are kind of like your database for console. They store important information about your services or service mesh configuration uh, because they have persistent state. Console clients will then talk to servers to get that information. Um, aside from that, console clients will run alongside your services and represent those services. So what we have uh, in addition to that is our console clients, um, they will control your Envoy proxies. So, so they're the part of the control plane that is talking to the proxy and telling it how to route traffic. Notice that the servers never talk to data plane directly. And the last kind of important point here is that the console clients, they need to be running uh, one per kind of VM or one per node. And that is because they need to represent your services. And so like here on, uh, on left, I have a VM uh, client that's running in a single VM. Or if you're running in Kubernetes, you will have one client running per each Kubernetes node. OK. Um, now I want to zoom in into the control plane. Um, and that is because this picture that I just showed you is not a full picture of everything that's going on in the console control plane. So this is the, just the control plane part of the uh, console service mesh. I had the servers and the clients and the clients talk to servers for important information. That's only part of the story. This is just the RPC protocol that the console clients are using. Uh, and that's, again, to get any kind of information that's stored in console servers. Aside from that, console clients and console servers, they all participate in a gossip protocol. Um, and they need to form this one common gossip pool. Um, now, if some of you don't know, gossip protocols is a family of protocols that's used in distributed computing. And they're used for disseminating information very quickly within the cluster to all the members of Gossip. So you can think of it kind of like how office rumors spread. If three coworkers start a rumor, then the next day the whole office will know. Uh, so that's kind of what console client uh, and console servers are using to know the important information about the cluster. So for example, if one of the clients will go down, then the rest of the cluster will learn through gossip that it's down. And so we should not be routing to this client. We should not be using this client anymore. Why do we use gossip? Well, because like I mentioned, it allows us to quickly disseminate this information within the cluster. And um, that's why kind of console is known for its very robust failure detection mechanism. One caveat with gossip is that everybody in gossip, everybody participating in this gossip protocol needs to be on the same network. So you kind of have to have this flat network because to allow for this constant communication between the members of the gossip pool. Okay, so I wanted to have the role of console clients all in one place, just to kind of summarize that all together. What do console clients do? 
they're the source of truth for your services and service health checks. That means that all services need to be registered with clients. Um, and, and they're the ones representing your service, services to the rest of the cluster. Uh, they can run health checks uh, because you run console clients on a node. Um, they can execute things like TCP or HTTP health checks for you. They can do failure detection. This is done through gossip. And lastly, they control the Envoy proxies. So they tell Envoys how to route traffic um, and how to configure them. Okay, so what did I talk about so far? We talked about generically kind of a service mesh and a generic architecture for the service mesh. We talked about the console service mesh and its architecture. We then looked a little bit closely into the control plane for console, how there's console clients, console servers, how they're all talking to each other. And then lastly, we talked about the role of the console clients play in the control plane. Okay, so now that we're all familiar and on the same page about the current architecture, I want to talk about the challenges. And these challenges, um, it's, it's worth mentioning that these challenges are the ones that we mostly see in container orchestrators. Um, and just as, as a heads up for the rest of my presentation and for my demos, I'll be using Kubernetes as the orchestrator. Uh, but a lot of these apply to other orchestrators as well, so just keep that in mind as I'm going through these slides and the demo. So we talked about how console launched in 2014 and what was common at the time, but the landscape today is different. We now have applications running in containers, and more so, majority of uh, those that are running in containers are using container orchestrators. That creates um, a lot more dynamic environments, generally speaking. Uh, things are more ephemeral, they're restarting all the time because orchestrators make it very easy for us to do so. And then lastly, we're kind of seeing this trend of nodeless container orchestrators or nodeless container environments. And that is when you don't have any VM nodes for your containers at all. Uh, so one example of that could be uh, IKEA's Fargate. So kind of in these environments, having node level agents doesn't necessarily make sense. So to cover all the challenges, I'm going to be using our HashiCups application. This is the demo application you probably have seen a lot in our demos. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it's uh, split into microservices so we can kind of um, easily demonstrate the service mesh features and use it for different service mesh capabilities. The first challenge that I want to cover is that client agents being the source of truth for your services. Uh, now, what we're looking at here is what would it look like to deploy something like our public API service from HashiCups on VMs? You, well, you would need your Envoy proxy and your console client running on the VM. Uh, but to register the service, it's very easy for those console clients to assume some persistent state and to have that registration file always there be available for you. This is not the case in container orchestrators. In orchestrators, console clients are running in a separate container and they don't have any persistent state. So, um, they do not know about the file system of your application. Aside from that, if you're using Kubernetes, you probably already have a Kubernetes service representing that. And if you're running in an environment like Kubernetes, that environment is really the source of truth for where your application is running because that's 
that's the scheduler for your application. So what we have in console today is we essentially allow you to sync that service, that Kubernetes service into console. And in this case, we'd need to register it with that specific client that's running on the VM, on the same Kubernetes node, because console clients are the source of truth. So this works well until our console clients restart. When console clients restart, they kind of lose all their registration because there's no persistent state and the rest of the cluster uh, very quickly learns through gossip that this client is down, so we should delete the public API service from the catalog. Then the client comes back up. We register it again with the console client, and then the console client tells the rest of the cluster that I have this new service registration. It's back up. So what we have here now is a few moments of downtime for our application while our public API was completely healthy the entire time. But because console clients were restarted, we have these few seconds of downtime that do not necessarily represent the true health of our services. So what we're seeing is that the console client is not necessarily always a reliable witness for whether our service is healthy and running. The second challenge that we're seeing is this duplication of health checking. Uh, because in container orchestrators, you already probably have some health checking that's built in. So here in Kubernetes, we have a kubelet running on a Kubernetes node. It can run health checks for us against both Envoy Proxy and our application. But because the console client also needs to be responsible for the health checks of our services so that our service mesh knows how to route traffic, the console clients also need to run these health checks and be aware of these health checks. So what we're seeing is that it's really kind of redundant. Container orchestrators already have their own health checking. They have their own way of detecting these failures. And so we don't necessarily need console clients to also be running those health checks for us. And the last challenge that I'll talk about, and I'll, I'll end that with a demo, is that networking is complex. Here I'm gonna use the whole, the entire HashiCops application uh, as my example. And now let's imagine that we have, um, our HashiCops application is actually run by two teams. We have a front end team and a back end team and they all want to run independently. They have their own Kubernetes clusters they want to run in, and these are the services that they uh, are maintaining. So let's look at what uh, that would be like if we added a service mesh. So first, this is our front end cluster without the service mesh, and this is our back end cluster without the service mesh with just these two example services in this case. Now let's add console to it, console service mesh to it. So you'll see we'll add our Envoy proxy that will run alongside our application. We'll have our console client running on each node. And then in this case, I'm using console servers that are running somewhere else. Okay. So at this point, we kind of have um, the following setup. Oh, hold on. Let me make it a little bit more complex. Each of these things are running in their own network. So front end cluster is in its own VPC, the back end cluster is in its own VPC, and the console servers are also in their own VPC. So a completely separate network for all these things. At this point, we have two problems that we need to solve, the data plane traffic and the control plane traffic. Luckily, the data plane traffic is very easy to solve. 
console has an edge proxy that's called a mesh gateway that allows us to easily route traffic between these kinds of networks. So that's great. The control plane traffic, on the other hand, is a little bit more complicated. So remember that we have this gossip pool that we need to have between the clients and the servers, which means the network has to be completely flat. Uh, in this case, we have two pairs of networks. There is the servers to front end and then servers to back end. And there's really no other solution for us than to do VPC peering. And the reason I'm saying VPC peering is not such a great solution here, um, or rather, I, I think it's not such a great solution, is because, um, well, in this case, we only have two clusters, so we can do that. But if you have more clusters, this could get a little bit hard to manage. Um, and more so at scale, if you have a lot of these clusters, you may run out of IP space. So you won't be able to do VPC peering for each of them. OK. So now uh, let, me do, let me do a demo. Uh, in this demo, I'll be showing you exactly the setup that I just talked about, um, the networking setup that I talked about, with HashiCubs being split between the front-end cluster and the back-end cluster. And let me just uh, show you what I have so far. I have set up those clusters, and everything is currently working. So on the left here, I have my front-end cluster. If I see what's running here, you will see that I have my console clients. I have three nodes, so there's one console client per each node. And then here are my, all my front-end services in the front-end cluster. Let me switch to this other tab. This is my back-end Kubernetes cluster. Let me see what I have here. Again, I have my console clients. Oh, oh, sorry. You can still see stuff. OK, great. And here are my backend services. Now, for my console server, I'm using HashiCorp Cloud Platform. So let me show you that. Um, this is great because I don't, I don't want to manage my console servers. So I have, I have it all set up in the cloud. I have a console cluster running here. But more importantly, I have my HashiCorp virtual network set up. And if I look into what that is, you'll see that I have two peering connections. So like I mentioned, I have to have VPC peering set up between the two clusters, which I have set up. And I have two of them, one for the front end cluster and one for the back end cluster. So everything is currently working. I have everything set up with peering. And let me just show you real quick that I do have access to my HashiCubs application, and I can see that. So if I port forward my front end, and I go to, I can see all my coffees. That's telling me that my front end cluster can talk to the back end cluster to populate all these products that it gets from the back end. So I know that they can connect between each other and everything's working. But now as an experiment, and just to kind of show you how things will not work without VPC peering, I want to delete the VPC peering for the back end cluster and just kind of see what happens. And the reason I'm doing this is because I, I want to see that failure state for console. What happens when you don't have everything set up? So I do have my backend VPC ID already printed out for me. So let me just copy that. And let me find that here. This is my backend VPC. I'm going to delete that. OK. So this VPC peering is being deleted now. 
while it's, it's being deleted, um, I want to go to my backend cluster and see what's going on there. Is anything failing yet? So let me watch my pods. So far, so good. Maybe it will just work, because who knows? Live demos. OK, I do see my console clients have switched from being ready to being not ready now. So we expect that because we completely severed that network connection. Let me take a look at the logs. Oops. kubectl logs. So no surprise, I do see some connection errors here. So my clients can no longer connect to servers and I see that things are pretty sad. Okay, but my services are still running, right? So can I still see my coffees? That's the real question. Okay, I'm not able to see any coffees anymore. And that is because here, if I go to console UI and I select my backend cluster here, you see all my services are unhealthy because the clients that they're running with, they're failing their health checks. And so the entire uh, set of services in this cluster is now unhealthy and console correctly is not routing any traffic to those services. Okay, so Let's leave it at that. that. That will be the end of this demo. And let me move to continue with our presentation. So what did I talk about so far? We talked about the challenges with our current architecture. Uh, we said that there are three challenges. One is that console clients being the source of truth does not always hold true in container orchestrators. The container orchestrator is the source of truth. We talked about duplication of health checking. And then lastly, we talked about how the networking setup is complicated because of gossip. And in the demo, I showed what happens if you remove that flat network from your cluster and that your cluster cannot work anymore. Okay, so now let's talk about this new architecture, console data planes, what does it look like? So first recap, this is, this, this is the diagram I had earlier on, the current architecture with the control plane, console servers, console clients. The first change we're gonna make, we're gonna remove the console clients. You probably could have already guessed that. So now we have our data plane talking directly to console servers. We don't need console clients anymore. The second change that we're gonna make is that we're gonna replace our plane envoy proxy with a new component called console data plane. Now this console data plane is not exactly playing the role of the, cons the console clients used to play and it's not replacing the Envoy proxy. Instead, it's more like a wrapper around the Envoy proxy, while at the same time, it knows how to talk to console servers at any given time. Okay, so we have a new component now, console data plane. What it does is it's First, it manages Envoy proxy. So now instead of the console clients controlling your Envoy proxy, you have console data plane that's running alongside your application and it's configuring the Envoy proxy. Second, it always knows how to talk to a console server. So it knows how to discover them, select a healthy server, and also load balance between those servers. So if one of the servers is now overloaded, it will switch to a different server. So hopefully that way we can have a more performant solution. And then lastly, it can also be a DNS proxy for um, 
things like console DNS. So this is convenient if you're using features like transparent proxy for your service mesh. You can continue using console DNS locally to quickly resolve all, this, all, the, all those DNS names. Okay, so how does console data plane help us solve all those problems we were having? Well, remember the first problem was that console clients were the source of truth for everything. By removing console clients, we're, we now don't have that anymore. There's no competing source of truth. If you're running in an orchestrator, we'll use your orchestrator as a source of truth. We'll sync your service into console, um, console servers in this case. And then our new component, console data plane, will talk to console servers directly to discover anything it needs to, to start the Envoy. The second problem was duplication of health checking. And again, by removing the console clients, we completely uh, got rid of that problem. Uh, we'll now use your container health checks directly. Your container already, um, container orchestrator, uh, in this case Kubernetes, will run those health checks and they will inform Kubernetes API of the status of those health checks. Uh, what we do in console is that we'll just sync that status into console so that uh, we can still route traffic correctly. And then lastly, the networking is now simpler. Um, why is that? Well, the main reason is because we removed gossip and we removed console clients. So there's no more requirement to have that one flat network between all your nodes. Um, aside from that, we, we used to need to have this bi-directional connection between your workload cluster and the console servers, uh, but that is no longer the case. The connection is now one directional. So your console servers never need to dial back into your workload network. Instead, connection goes just one way. So that is convenient if you already have console servers that are exposed for API or UI, you can essentially use the same method now to reach your console servers. You don't need any other additional setup to make gossip work. So we solved all our problems. Now, let me do another demo. So remember that we we broke this cluster completely by removing the VPC peering. We broke our backend cluster. Um, let me just confirm that everything is still pretty unhappy here. I still cannot query any coffees. And when I go to my backend cluster, the clients didn't magically fix themselves. Now with this VPC peering removed, I want to simply just upgrade to this new architecture and see if that fixes things. So to do that, I will run a Helm upgrade on my cluster. And in this case, I would need a new version of console Kubernetes and some Helm values that I was using. And start the upgrade. Now this will take a few moments, so in the meantime, I want to open another, another tab and uh, watch kind of my cluster and see what's going on. So I'll target my backend cluster and then I will watch my pods. So I see that the console clients are already gone, so there's no more client pods left here. They've been removed completely. And now we're seeing some of the console Kubernetes components being upgraded to this new version so that they can talk directly to servers um, and do things like service registrations. Okay. The next thing I'm gonna need to do is upgrade my services. Because remember, we used to have Envoy proxy running alongside, but now we need this new sidecar 
console data plane that should be managing everything for us. So I will need to upgrade my services to, to make that happen. So to do that, I will do kubectl rollout restart. And I'll do all services at the same time because it's a demo. OK. So this should take a few seconds for them to get restarted. We'll inject now a new proxy, the, con the console data plane uh, sidecar. OK. So everything is up and running. Let me see if this fixed anything. Okay, and I can already see everything working. <laughs> Just to prove to you that it's not magic, um, I, I wanna order myself a coffee. Just to show you that the whole end-to-end -end workflow now works completely with console clients removed, the VPC peering completely gone from my clusters. Uh, of course, I'm gonna get a connected Chino. I'm gonna go to checkout, and I'll need to create a new account here. Okay, some credit card details, pay. Okay, and now we have our coffee. So everything works now. I don't, I don't have to have complicated networking anymore. I don't have, I just have that one VPC peering left for the cluster that I haven't upgraded yet. And the whole end-to-end, -end, my whole application works spread across two clusters. Okay, so that will end this demo. So, oh, too early. <laughs> Um, so what did I talk about in this talk? Well, we covered the existing architecture of console. We talked about the control plane and the data plane, how the control plane has two components, the servers and the clients, and how they all talk to each other. We talked about some of the challenges of um, having console clients and container orchestrators some of the challenges with this architecture. We talked about console clients being the source of truth, the duplication of health checking, and the complicated networking. We saw in the demo what happens when you remove your flat network and how the cluster fails in that case. And then lastly, we introduced our new architecture. We introduced a new component console data plane that can now run alongside your proxy that makes things much more simple. You don't need that extra networking setup. You're only running this one component and you don't have to run console clients at all in your cluster anymore. They're no longer required. Okay, so at this point, some of you may be wondering how you can try it out. Well, it's available in console 114 beta that's available today. You would need console case 1.0 beta that's also available today. It will be coming in HashiCorp Cloud Platform uh, in November. And then lastly, a small caveat is that this is only currently supported on Kubernetes with other platforms coming soon. So stay tuned, we'll support that in other platforms pretty soon. Okay, that, that's the end of my talk. Thank you all so much for coming here, for listening to this talk. And if you have any questions, I'll be available somewhere here to answer them. Thank you so much.